Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first talk of 2021 in our Opera and Conversation series presented by Oxford Contemporary Opera. Today, we are absolutely delighted to welcome Sir Graham Vick, who's here with us to talk to you. He is the Artistic Director of Birmingham Opera Company and works in the world's major opera houses with the world's leading conductors. He was Director of Productions at the Scottish Opera and at Glyndebourne. His many awards include Italy's Premier Arbiati seven times and he's a Chevalier de Lorge de Arts and de Lettres. That was a wordful and I hope I said it right. Um, his, he's con uh, directed so many operas and I'm sure he'll be talking to us about his vast experience. He's also directed well premieres of Berio's Uti at the La Scala, Stockhausen's Mittwoch Our Licht and Battistelli's Wake in Birmingham. Again, very sorry if I've um, butchered a lot of those, but Sir Graham, thank you so much for being here today. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand it to the president of our society, Belina, who will be taking you through the rest of the next hour. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Priya. Um, hi everyone, welcome to our new series of talks. And thank you so much for joining us here in the new year. Wherever you are, I really hope that you're well and that you enjoy the next hour that we have with Sir Graham. As Priya mentioned, I'm Zelina Vulliami. I'm the president of Oxford Contemporary Opera and I'll be interviewing Graham today. So without further ado, I wanted to ask by, well, begin by asking you, Graham, um, why opera? What was it that attracted you to opera in the first place? And how did you get into opera directing? Uh, well, I'll give you, I'll try to do a short answer. Peter Pan at five um, was a mind-blowing, mind-opening experience. So I, I, I sat in a theater and I saw a grumpy father punished for not understanding his children. I saw these fanciful children fly through the window to the land of the imagination where everything was possible and he could fly. And uh, it was completely for me. I went home, I wrote the play of Peter Pan. We performed it at my school for the parents. I was very upset because I couldn't play Peter Pan. A girl was cast, cast, uh, cast as Peter Pan. So I rewrote the play so that Captain Hook had more lines. And uh, then when I was 10, I got interested in um, serious music. I think I was before that I'm from Merseyside. So I was obsessed with pop music at the time and the biggest time the Beatles. My brother played uh, guitar in a, uh, um, in a rock band. Then when I was 12, I saw some programs on BBC two on the television uh, um, and fell completely head over heels into opera, which became absorbing from that moment I spent every penny of my pocket money and every moment I could, reading about it, listening to it and going to it. That's the short answer. The short answer. And so then of course you ended up founding Birmingham Opera Company. Could you tell us a bit about your ethos and your method of work as a company? Oh my God, that's a big jump. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Let's just go a couple of steps, one step, two steps to get to Birmingham. Um, uh, I started directly in Glasgow for Scottish Opera. I started there uh, a little community opera company um, with a, a government jobs creation scheme grant. So we had 12 people, uh, five singers, pianist, stage manager, me, uh, uh, and we did small operas with piano. You see why this is relevant. We did projects. I developed and invented education work pretty much. Um, I work in prisons. I work in factories, a series of factory shows. Uh, this was very successful. Uh, we hit, you know, we got on national news, on News at 10, on the six o'clock news for being in Glasgow factory canteens. Um, and it was a, a a lot of fun, of course, and great for me at 23. And then when I was 25, the money ran out and nobody wanted to pay for the work. And so for the first time I experienced what I was regularly to experience 
which is people saying, oh, what you're doing is amazing with the way that people respond to what you're doing, the way that you show opera that everybody can respond to it is fantastic, but nobody wanted to spend any money on it, especially if it took away the money from paying for what they believed to be the main work. Um, 10 years after that, I do a big um, experiment for Opera North, uh, who let me take, try and do a, a community project, in fact, of West Side Story, Bernstein. Uh, and I did it with 300 unemployed people in an enormous uh, empty mill outside Bradford. Um, and that was the, you know, that was the road to Damascus moment, really, I suppose. Um, in that, that we just, it was an amazing show. It was completely promenade, wild, uh, uh, beyond any control, but thrilling. All, all of the performers were non-professional. Um, I was the, uh, there was myself, a choreographer, um, a musician. We were the only professionals. Um, uh, we overspent, the budget was £1,200 for the whole project. I spent £75,000 or £74,000 on the heating. These are very, these are, I look, you guys do operas, you understand the reality, no? It all went on the heating because it was a very cold February and we had a, a mill the size of a football pitch to heat. Um, but it was fabulous, and we were on News of Ten. We had full page articles in newspapers. We, everybody was very happy. Um, and that's what I wanted to do from the, when I formed the company that became Birmingham Opera Company. But it went through various, uh, various formations because at the time, money from the Arts Council was available for touring. Um, so I, uh, I ran it as a touring company for the first 12 years. And then after that, even though we were playing in, you know, school gymnasiums under Spaghetti Junction in Birmingham, we were doing interesting places, but the audience was still the audience that you expect to come to opera. We, we were doing interesting places, interesting projects, but the audience was the same. I wasn't shifting. We even did, uh, um, Ravi Shankar came and, and, and wrote an opera with me, um, which was then sung in Hindi. It was danced. We had marvelous Indian musicians uh, and an entirely white audience. Um, that, that was a salutary experience. So then in 2000, I, I was thinking, in fact, of closing Birmingham down because I felt I'd hit a, uh, a buffer. I, I didn't know which way to move. Um, and I was quite depressed about the fact we'd done a lot of interesting, exciting stuff, but it seemed really to be self-serving. I was just finishing at Glyndebourne, where I was equally challenged with the question of whether that was only self-serving. Uh, certainly my motivation for going to Glyndebourne had been entirely self-serving. So I was looking for something else and I just decided, I went to the Arts Council and the city and said, I want to change completely what the company is. I'd like all the same money, but instead of doing 30 performances up and down the country, I'll do six in Birmingham, but they will be site specific and I will involve hundreds of people. And I, will, I want to do a, a new experiment in how to go about working, which will make these great works speak to a lot more people. That's basically what it was for. And then with that basis, we changed the name of the company and the way of working into site-specific, first of all. So the performances are never in theatres, always in found spaces. Um, and involving volunteer participants, initially as actors, 
um, and subsequently as a chorus which we develop. The, the first piece we did was Votsek, the obvious title for a popular opera company. Um, so we, we did Votsek in a big empty warehouse uh, and we had beginner's luck. It was a, a great show, it sold out and I mean, not hard to see why, you know, what's that fantastic story in Birmingham about, uh, about poverty, about medical experiments, teenage pregnancy, uh, the, brutality of the brutality of the military, uh, lots of issues very easy to put at the heart of the city. But also everyone was just very excited to be standing in the middle of an opera going on around and through them with the singers pushing through them pushing past them, standing over them. And in fact, with it, when the audience arrived into the middle of an experiment, they had to put those uh, hospital plastic bags over their feet before they were allowed to walk on the white floor and were challenged in many ways by very brave volunteers. And the volunteers all came from non-theatrical groups. So there were a lot of groups already existed. There was a Young Offenders program. There was one theatre company, it was a gay theatre, political gay theatre company in, um, in Birmingham. But we did one big group of 60 volunteers who, did, who acted in the middle of the whole show and gave it a, a dramaturgical context. And then in each of the 11 interludes, one separate group from somewhere in the city performed that interlude on a theme of the piece. And for them, so the... The, the, the acting bunch came to our rehearsals and I rehearsed them in. The others, I went out to various parts of the city one or two nights a week and worked with them there, brought them in at the last minute. So it was uh, 200 people as well as the cast in the end. Um, and then we've gone on from there. We've done pretty much everything, including Stockhausen's mid Stockhausen League. Um, and we've formed the chorus, we've done Kervanshina with a big chorus, we've done Othello, of course, with a black tenor, and a black Iago, and a black Montano, and a black Cassio. Um, we've done, I mean, we've, we've done pretty wild things, we've done exciting versions of Stravinsky's Lenos, we've commissioned new pieces, and the last big piece we did was Lady Macbeth and Sense. Okay, enough. Thank you for that amazing review of sort of everything you've done. I realise it was a very large question, but I think that's a really good introduction to your company and the sorts of work that you've done. I guess something that we as a society are focused on is challenging, you know, the, the sort of commonly held notion of opera being elitist and all of that sort of thing and partly the way that we've done that is by getting as you said commissioning new works and I was wondering what you think about the label of opera and whether you think it's still an accurate label to use especially with new works or whether we should be turning to some other terms like music theatre etc what do you think about that label of opera? Um, the discussion seems very last century to me in a way um, I call Birmingham Opera Company uh, uh, Birmingham Opera Company because it says what it is on the tin. Um, I've spent my life trying to do this, but I think the aim is to have people not be prejudiced about the word, not change the word. Isn't that the job, really? Um, you know, the, uh, I mean, Luciano Berrio's opera is what he called the first. The first one I did was uh, Rena Scolto. And he called that a musical action. Uh, people were, you know, the late 20th century, everybody was trying to find a new label, was, was experimenting with non-narrative opera, very big in the late 20th century. Um, music theatre, obviously, 60s, 70s term. Um, but I think there's nothing wrong with opera because opera has got this incredibly rich 400 year history. You know, uh, and the only thing wrong with the word is the prejudice. Uh, it is a fight. Look, um, it's tragic. <laughs> he says, sadly, um, that 40 years on, from when I started directing, 45 years from when I started directing, 
the word is still regarded as elitist. More in Britain than in any other country I work in, possibly America. No, because we here have also encouraged that with the horrible division into opera provision between um, and the subsidized sector uh, and country house opera. Um, and it's not that I've got anything particularly against country house opera, except that now that we need people to give money to the poor, they're too busy giving their money to the rich. A really basic observation of what goes on. Um, so my mission, to use an embarrassing word, in Birmingham, because I love this stuff, has been people to, to get people to love what I love, not to change what it is so that they love it. Um, you know, my favorite Pete opera is Beethoven's Fidelio. Um, I completely love the 17th century Italian repertoire. We've done Monteverdi's Ulisse in Birmingham uh, as a big promenade show about immigration. Um, and it was one of our most popular for the volunteers. For them, for all those people who don't know about opera, they don't know the difference between Monteverdi, Musonsky, Verdi, Puccini, or Mozart. They come because we do it. Um, and it's a very clean starting point. They'll come to Michael Tippett, it's fine. Um, what you need to give them and deliver is content, meaning. Um, and the great, you know, the great works are the great works that I've, for all the thrill of some of the great modern works that I've been able to direct, I have yet to do one that will top Fidelio. No? Or even because you've had two there. So uh, uh, that is, the, uh, so I'm not embarrassed by operas. Uh, the way that I direct is not embarrassed by the fact that people sing. Um, uh, of course they have to act, but uh, this is a whole other discussion we're going on to now, but it is central, I think, that um, I believe that opera is its own art form. It's a huge art form, but it's based on singing. That's where its heart, its expressive heart is in singing and is in the song word. Um, and the human voice is the most natural when, some, when a singer is good and open and, and, and um, um, in touch with themselves, is the most immediate conduit to the human soul. So, what it is, of course, like those guys in Italy said, where speaking stops being sufficiently expressive because of the word, because of where the words get stuck, like Aaron got stuck in the face of Moses. The music takes over. Not only the music, but the song. It's music through a human voice that's the center of opera. And no matter how it's developed to the most ridiculous excesses of, you know, Zemlinsky and Richard Strauss, um, to five players with, uh, um, with Cavalli sometimes, it's all absolutely amazing, but it centers on a human being and a natural sound. And that's opera, it's opera singing, and we've got to love it, and we've got to tell people it's great. That's what it, it's about. It's not about a bow tie, and it's not, of course, about going to a smart place, which is why in Birmingham, we don't perform in theatres. We perform in places people have worked, do work, live, walk past, rock venues, and abandon ice ring. And Obviously, there is zero dress code. Uh, you're, in fact, you can bring drinks in because everybody's standing up. We allow the use of mobile telephones. Uh, and consequently, people are very respectful. People don't talk. They do photograph occasionally, but that's fine because it's great. People are interested. They film sometimes. And we allow that. 
I mean, we're very, that's, we allow people to be late, to come in and out, or and we break every rule. Uh, and consequently, people are comfortable. And that, I think, is the real point. In fact, in Vodsec, I had a man with a baseball bat um, telling the audience that nobody was allowed in wearing a tie. Um, which some people got a bit grumpy about because it was the first one, no one was ready. And I made them take their tie off because for those of you who don't know, in order to have tea at the Savoy Hotel, you have to wear a jacket. Probably the same at the Randolph, I can't remember. Anyway, on we go. No, that's that's great. And I, I kind of completely share your opinion about opera being able to encompass so many things, but ultimately being about this wonderful music and voice that we love. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned the voice there, because I think so often, you know, people associate opera with the big stars and the big singers. So I was wondering how you've sort of negotiated that by having, for example, volunteer choruses and how you've sort of been able to educate people about the sort of joys of opera singing in that way? Well, Hugh, gosh, these are big questions. Um, well, I went through great, I've been through stars and at the other end, really. Um, um, there've been a few, a couple of great, great singers have really inspired me. And, you know, when somebody is fantastically good, of course, it's very challenging for me. Uh, but star opera singers, as opposed to very, very good opera singers, um, much less interesting. Ultimately, it, it's what I call the, the Tom Cruise problem. No, nobody goes to see a Tom Cruise film to see anything except Tom Cruise. You don't go to see a character or a role. And similarly, if anybody buys a ticket or ever has done for Placido Domingo, they've never bought it, they've never wanted him to disappear into a character. Everybody wants the star delivering the material. That is fundamentally anti theatric. It means, in fact, they perform their brand in modern parlance. If you go and see Netrebka, if you go and see Kaufman, you know exactly what you're going to get. And so you might begin, here I'll be very rude, but I'm going to say anyway, you might begin by thinking that the new tenor is really interesting and fascinating. Then by his fourth or fifth role, you're beginning to think it's a little bit stuck and mannered. And eventually you'll think that's all he's got to offer. But it's saleable, it's packageable because it's a groove that sells recordings that goes someone that's found its public. This, many people fall in, I think, to this rather disappointingly narrow track. Um, the liberation of singing, the fact that it should go all the way through the whole of your persona, the whole of your physical and psychic persona, should the sound should resonate through it all, the people who are capable of living and communicating through that sound are the true um, high priests and priestesses of the art form. Um, and that's what I talk about in Birmingham. It's what I work with the singers in front of volunteers and allow them to talk about it. It's, you know, a, 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 a non-expert audience with nothing to lose or gain um, are completely fearless. And so they'll say, oh, I don't believe that. I didn't understand that. It's incredibly challenging initially for the singers because instead of a nice dark auditorium and an orchestra pit, you've got a lot of faces standing in front. You say, I didn't get that. And the singer looks at me going, well, what should I do? Well, I'm just going to say, well, you can do better. You know, they say, well, what's the problem? And I say, you're not communicating with these people. You're just do. I can't tell you what to do because how to communicate 
is your is 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 everybody's job. No? So when I you know when I speak to my partner, I'm one person. Well, I'm more than one person when I speak to my partner, but of course. But you know, when I used to speak to my mother, I was a very good son. I was always respectful. If I speak to a new conductor, I'm a completely different person to if I speak to a conductor I work with 10 times, obviously. I communicate differently. If people know me and trust me, I miss out the tag. I'm very blunt, I'm very direct. If I don't know you, I maneuver around. I'm all, but you're always looking with new people when you talk to them for ways in. It's tuning a radio, no? You're turning the knob all the time, trying it's going crackle, 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 and then it gets very good. Oh, you go a bit too far, and then you find a point of contact. Um, yeah, well, me, listening to music is like that. Um, and the job of directing and the job of teaching is trying to give that context, is turn the knobs for everybody simultaneously so that they can hear it and to see when they're and feel when they're not quite receiving and finding what you need to do to make them receive it. So our singers have this right in front of them, hours each week, challenging them, but also gratifying them when they're believed. So the process is a great training in the truth as opposed to mannerism. And that is the opposite with a star system and a situation like ours. So it, you know, I can, I have no problem in saying I've, I did, uh, I did Otello, Verdi's Otello at La Scala with Riccardo Muti and Domingo, uh, a, a new production. And I've done it in Birmingham with Ronald Sam and our chorus. There is no question that the event in Birmingham had 10 times the raw emotive power of the one at, uh, at La Scala. The one at La Scala had a grandeur and a beauty uh, and, uh, and a depth of culture um, and was a marvelous deliverance, delivery of a great work from the repertoire. The work in Birmingham cut right through you with this horrible story and broke your heart and people wept. And how much of that communication do you attribute to, firstly, the staging style, you know, in the promenade theatre way, and secondly, to the fact that I think I'm right in saying that your Fidelio was in English? Um, correct. Everything in Birmingham is in English. Yeah. Listen, there's no substitute for understanding the words. And there's hardly a composer who wouldn't want the audience to understand the words of his operas. Um, it's gone so out of fashion, it's a big struggle. Um, but it is what I think, you know. Why was Mozart desperate to write a German opera? Not for himself, but so that the audience would, it would be their language. Um, it's completely different. It's a different connection for the artist and for the audience. Um, uh, and reading the words is, a, is really bad, actually. Uh, you know, it's a help. It gets you through long, it gets you through capriccio, which will otherwise uh, lose, your, lose the will to live. Uh, it's a help, you know, in the first act of Meister Singer because it goes by so fast. But reading the words dulls your ear. You dulls your oral perception and you don't, you don't get what the words mean because they don't mean what they say on the page is not enough. It's how they're sung that matters. So it has to be how the meaning is sung, not how the, how the concrete part of the word is sung. That's what I completely believe and everything. And I work, I mean, I've started now in, in, in Italy. I managed a production of, of, of Magic Flute in Italian against enormous opposition, but we did it. 
Um, and I'm trying to do some more projects like that. Um, and uh, yeah, well, so that's crucial. The promenade thing is great. Of course, it's fantastic. The immediacy to smell the sweat, to watch the steam rising off the face of, of people's heads in some cold factory uh, um, is an unmatchable experience. And that is right. An audience on its feet is attentive. Um, and above all, an audience that needs to work in order to choose where to look, where to go. Will I follow the action or will I decide to lead against the wall and sit this one out? Will I look on my phone? Will I, what's going to happen? Do I want to get to the front? Will I look behind me because someone's singing there? It's all choices and each choice makes you active. It's really, really simple. So just like after exercising, you're in a good mood and you're feeling good about yourself because you're up there and your body's engaged. It's like being like that all the way through an opera. You're part of the energy of the room. So what is the process involved with putting together such a massive performance like that in, you know, you performed in places like warehouses and factories and I think aircraft hangars and all sorts of places and with lots of different people as well with all your volunteers. How on earth do you get something like that together? Well, the first, you start at the beginning and then you keep going. That is the most important thing to say. Uh, you never have any idea where you're headed. I, I, I remember very vividly, I did in my mid-30s, a series of very spectacular kind of virtuoso staging shows. One of them was the Berio Opera, that was the first thing I did at, at the Opera House, Covent Garden, um, or Norena Skolko. It was a very big success, made my career. So suddenly they wanted the production in Paris and Chicago. Very exciting for me, career taking off internationally. Good. So I sit down to prepare it for Paris. I look at this recording and completely froze because I could not possibly, I couldn't see how I could do it. Had I known what I was going to direct, I would not have been able to take the first day of rehearsal because ultimately, I, you know, a show is just made up of an endless series of small steps. Thank God. You don't have to ever do the whole show. What you need to do is do one bit and then do another bit and then do the next bit along. And then, so some of it's horrible because there's a never ending series of first days. First day, horrible. I hate them. So you get the first day when you show the project to the management. Horrible, horrible, horrible. You get through that. Fwa. Then you have to show it to all the technical crew. Challenging because you want them to be with you. You want them to think it's a great show and you're gorgeous and they're going to give you their bet. And then and that. No. So far, so good. Get to day one of the rehearsals. Well, that's the weekend in which I come closest to divorce. I turn into a horrible human being. I'm terrified, angry, bitter, resentful, and bury myself in a hole. Then I go into the rehearsal room and become another person. And you manage to get through that first day. You tap dance, you show, everybody's thrilled. And with a huge sigh of relief, you start rehearsals, only to have to do it all over again for the chorus back to the beginning, back to the scenery, back to why you did it, what you thought, aren't I wonderful, don't you love me? Isn't this great, aren't we gonna have a good time? So all of that is a complete distraction from what you're trying to do, but an inevitable and necessary part of getting everybody to join the journey, join the train, and want to be on it and look forward to it because it's everybody else's little steps that makes the best work. Um, and that's what, of course, has developed and grown in Birmingham 
It's what I've always done with choruses, with actors. Always I've spoken to a chorus as though they're a human being. I mean, one-to-one -one always. Um, and always I've done a lot of detail, character, everybody. I learned everybody's name in the first rehearsal, all that kind of thing. Um, but that's become a whole other art form, really, using volunteers and bringing into the body of a great opera a body of great human beings. And you have this amazing breadth of life, experience and understanding, and you put them in touch with the subject matter, in touch with the music, and work around and through all of that, making material which they create, which I guide, um, and consequently giving everybody in some kind of way a voice and giving the piece this incredibly rich texture, this depth, um, depth is not quite the right word, um, Italian word, spessore, kind of, anyway, you get the idea, density of texture, no? um, which means that an audience, wherever they go, there is somebody, whichever way you turn, sometimes under your feet, sometimes trapped in the telephone box, somebody is living through this opera in their own way, in some tangential way, in some direct way, but the whole air is vibrating with people's response to what these pieces are about. Obviously, it means we've never done the Barbara of Seville, you know, um, but we have done Mazolski's Kovacina. Mythic pieces are great. Um, and its success is above all human lives. Is above all that rawness because you can get the chorus of La Scala to do the most phenomenal mezzo voce, mezzo piano in the middle register. Magic like you've never heard. And that's utterly beautiful. But if you want to hear the voice of the Russian people crying in despair, and anger about religion and about politics. If you hear what we do in Birmingham, it speaks in an entirely different way, devoid of polish, devoid of sophistication, devoid of training, but direct from the soul, direct from the heart, and Meaning being 100% what they're doing, not meaning via technique, via beauty, via sound, via keeping everybody else happy. It's unique. And that is a different way to deliver art. Prosciutto crudo, not prosciutto cotto. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's that's such an incredible part of, you know, of your work and your ethos really is having that rawness of, you know, so-called sort of real people singing about these really real issues, um, which kind of leads me to my next question, really, which I do want to spend a bit of time talking about, you know, the, the sort of impact of the pandemic on opera and everything. But just quickly before we go there, um, your productions are often described as revisionist. And I was just wondering whether first you think that label is accurate and whether also it's a real priority for you to update these works and you know include sort of modern political themes and political messages in your productions really um if the piece is political it's political i think uh you know we didn't invent politics now um the updating i mean i do update an awful lot now um I tried in the uh, early 90s, I had a, uh, um, a very successful period, actually, uh, in which I did a series of really beautiful, in their period, modern classics. 
and Meisters who are Covent Garden, uh, and Yeg in the Glyndebourne uh, in particular, and the Mitridat who are Covent Garden. Um, and the truth was, I really believed that they were too beautiful. And that the audience stopped at that given a way out of engaging with an opera, an audience will avoid engaging with an opera, I think. So, I mean, I'm trying to develop an audience in Birmingham I, that wants opera to be meaningful adult and, enga and that comes for engagement. I'm, they're learning, as they learn opera, they're learning that that is opera. That's what I believe. They're not learning it through, isn't it lovely? And it's Mimi and a shawl, and it's in a foreign language, but don't worry, you'll be, it's, it's all beautiful and you can read what it means on top of the stage. All, it's all about distance. It's all about avoiding. Um, the worst thing people used to say to me in my glideboard years was another magical glideboard evening. After Lulu, you know, it's not what you want to hear. Um, so that is, that is what we, that's what is, the elitist side of opera is that, is a great art form hijacked for a highly polished social entertainment. Not for an important state, you know? Um, So I, I, all I'm ever trying to do, of course, is not do my gloss on something, but to do what I see, what I hear, what I feel. I only do operas when I have a response. There are some operas I've never done. Um, you know, I did uh, uh, um, Madame Butterfly, for instance, uh, I did an English National Opera, was around for, for 20 years. It was a very, very in-period and revisionist production. Um, what was revisionist about it was because Butterfly's son had, was a Japanese boy and the show was about self-delusion. So it was all seen through the eyes of Suzuki, Pinkerton, and it was about a woman's willful determination not to see or accept what everybody knew. So that's what the opera is. Um, why did I do it like that? Because the, I got a letter asking me to do it when I was in, uh, I, I was working in Leeds. And by luck, Covent Garden was performing Madame Butterfly in Manchester the next night. So I rushed over. You know, I'd just been offered Madame Butterfly Coliseum, big deal. I was 28 or something. And I, go and, I went to see Madame Butterfly. I sat there, I hated it, and I turned it down. That English National Opera, I just turned it down. And then David Pound, as he was, rang me up and says, why have you turned it down? He said, well, because it's blah, 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 blah. And he said, no, 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 look again, look again. You, you know, you've got to do this piece. That's why you have to do it. So, anyway, I looked again. And of course, the problem is, if you take it on face value, Butterfly says, I know he loves me. She screams a high note. There's a huge climax in the orchestra and the audience applauds. Now what they're applauding is ridiculous because if they've followed the text, they know perfectly well that he's got a girlfriend in America. So why are they applauding? What is this? Her stupidity? Her pointless and ridiculous act of faith as she calls it? Not, they're just applauding because they're having a nice time and they're utterly thoughtless. So with that moment of anger in my head, I set about looking at Butterfly as a version in which the opera was like the image of the butterfly, its wings with the pin, and decided it's the audience that should be pinned to their seat, squirming, as I made every step of the journey, as I made them not look away, 
as I prove to them in an unrelentingly cruel way what that what they were watching was willful, was a lying, was self delusion, and was destructive. Uh, and that's what I think the opera is. So, is it revisionist? For some people, it was revisionist. For me, it's what the opera is. So, I've revised nothing. Definitely. I think that's, yeah, such an interesting insight. Thank you. Um, so, just to move on, because we're I'm aware of time, um, I wanted to ask you about you know, everything that's sort of happened recently and particularly on, I suppose, certain issues um, regarding the pandemic. I mean, firstly, how has Birmingham Opera Company adapted to the pandemic and how do you think, you know, what does the future like look like looking forwards? Again, it's a very big question, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. We adapted relatively low key. Um, Part of what Birmingham Opera Company is um, philosophically and why I created it is four people and one office. Um, it's deliberately not an institution. So it's immensely flexible, it's immensely agile. Um, so other than that we paid the freelancers for the work we'd engaged them for, uh, we've done digital operations and we've kept carefully done. We've done quite a lot of that. We put, uh, we've done a lot of interaction within the city. We've put some of our work out, of course, on, um, uh, on Opera Vision. But again, quite carefully placed Michael Tippett's The Icebreak. Um, the BBC put out our Othello again. I mean, the, the political side of it. And I put out from Italy, in fact, the magic flute that I did in Italian is on Opera Vision for the same reason, because there are a hundred um, citizens and refugees in Maturata are performing in that magic flute. Um, so that's where Birmingham's up to, and it will come out doing a new production of Rheingold. Um, the mess of opera and this pandemic is of course enormous because not only pandemic, but we, of course, Black Lives Matter um, uh, uh, has happened this year. And so really for the first time, a lot of people are finally taking diversity as a serious issue. Um, but not really, of course, because they're not really doing their proper work at the moment. So they're doing small projects, small audiences. So it's quite easy to change the apparent face very quickly. Um, the truth is when we come out, we've now discovered, I believe everybody has now discovered what, what, what we've always known in Birmingham, which is we should be performing for the whole city. That's what our work is and for. But our tickets cost 17 pounds 50 for everybody. That's the top price. Well, it's probably going to be more next time. But £10 if you're in it. £10 if we think you should only pay £10. That's, and that gives us a completely different audience. So I read, you know, I read statements on the websites of theatres, policies about equal opportunity, and so on. But I don't think we can fool ourselves that there is any possibility of any kind of equality, any kind of cultural democracy, unless people can afford to buy a ticket. Um, and I think that is going to be an enormous problem because the money is tighter. Of course, everybody's lost money. The government will not want to give more money. They'll want to give less money because there's so many other places to give it. Cities are practically bankrupt at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, the wealthy, and this is the challenge we've all got to face and influence society, because the wealthy 
are giving to themselves. The opera companies that perform for bow ties, for people who could take a day off work um, and pay 200 pounds a ticket to sit with other people like themselves, are doing really well and they're getting philanthropic giving because those people want to keep that world alive. At the other end, we're all struggling because who wants to give money to an empty factory, a big coal factory? The truth is if you want to give money to a socially engineered project, you'll give it to the, I don't know, the Prince of Wales Trust or something. But so that whole important area of work that we now see we have to do, we have to see, we have to include a much broader community in our, in what we produce, in how we produce it, in how we communicate its truths, in who we put on our stages, in our pits, in our choruses, in who you see around you in the audience, all has to change in order to have any validity. But I don't see at the moment any artists leading that charge. And I think it has to be an artistic charge because we have a profession governed now by business reality. Um, it's how it's arrived, it's nobody's fault. It's arrived step at a time. Um, it's arrived anyway, because of course we have a government, we have a society. Um, but, you know, Napoleon said we were a nation of shopkeepers a very long time before Brexit. Um, we're only, showing ourselves to be who we are. And we need to step up. We need to step up, I think, um, and not think of opera as a luxury, but it's those of us who love it who need to step up. It's those of us who love it, who want it, who work in it. So as all of your people in your society are gonna come out of there and you're all bright, sharp people, you might be running opera companies. Can I ask you for your ambition either not to run Covent Garden or run it and change it? Because what happens is gifted, talented people who start off initially as angry as me get sucked into this amazing thing that is opera this big, soupy, glorious, glamorous, thrilling world, and they lose their judgment. And they lose their social and political judgment and turn their back on where they came from. Uh, so that's it. That's the message for you all that I wanted to do and that I want to say is be true to yourselves because the world has to be changed. We can't go on. It's ridiculous. It's simply ridiculous for a theatre like the, for, for the Royal Opera to say it's available for everybody. It's nonsense. And we know it's nonsense, but we know that they produce, you know, on all of these theatres, what is now the skill of management to produce statistics, documents like the government, outcome all the figures, the graphs, the charts, the postcodes, and everybody says, aren't they doing really well? It's so much better. They're touching all these people, but none of those people are turning up on a wet Thursday night for Sonambula, which is very intelligent of them, I think. It's a good one to miss. Yeah. Um, such a powerful message. Thank you. And I, I completely emphasize what Graham has just said about anyone who wants to go into the opera industry, always following that advice of, you know, never turning your back on, on others. Um, 
yeah, a really powerful statement. Thank you. I, I think we're running out of time a little bit. So let's turn to some questions from our audience. Um, so our first question is, what advice would you give to a young director who wants to stage site-specific opera in unusual locations? And what are the main challenges of doing this? Oh, um, well, it is a nightmare. Um, the, uh, get yourself a really good technical collaborator. Um, because aside the problems logistically of staging a show are only joyous. Site specific is like a wonderful playground. It's a thrill, but you need a license. So you need the place to be licensable. You need to do what you do. You need risk assessments. You need to know all the things you can and can't do. You need to find out how to get the permissions that nobody wants to give you how you get into the buildings that no one wants to let you in. That's the real trick of, of the site specific thing is to be allowed to do it in the first place. And for that, you need somebody pretty savvy. Um, then I would say it's only ever expensive. Do it in the summer. But even we did, uh, I remember we did Idomeneo in, a, in the summer in, in think, because we normally do March, thinking it, it would be better. And on the, on the first night, we were giving army blankets out to the audience because it was freezing cold. And because it was July, we had no heating ready. So there is all of that. Uh, I mean, but it's the best possible thing, site specific. So I would never put, want to put anybody off trying to do it, it's, it's where I'm happiest. Yeah, I, I have to say every site specific production I've ever seen has blown my mind in different ways. And on that note, do you have any advice for getting funding for these sorts of alternative projects? God, if I had, I'd keep completely quiet, I think. Um, oh, I think the funding is really tough, is really, really tough now. Um, the real hard thing is that applications are enormous, to, as you must all know, because you think, oh, there are, there are all these trusts and funds. Let's, I mean, they, they want you to, to jump through hoops. No? Um, I think what you have to offer is in the way that you propose whatever your project is, it has to have some kind of continuing benefit. Um, people are no longer so keen on giving just so a piece of work can happen. They want change. They want change is actually uh, uh, probably what people want most. They want demonstration of change, influence, and so on. Um, so it, you know, it might be easier to form a really boring opera company and then ask for money to change it into an interesting one. Because if you form an interesting opera company, you can't change it. Paradoxically, uh, it's the movement, not the quality of the work, that a lot of money uh, is available for at the moment, it's, um, with, with especially with trust and foundations. Um, I'm not very good at it. So I'm, actually, I should say I'm the wrong person. I hate asking for money. I just think the government should pay. I just think we should have better public subsidy. I think they should know how, how it matters. I, that's what I think. I think they shouldn't give where people, they shouldn't give it to organizations where I can't afford a ticket. Uh, and that money should be given to, uh, that's what I really think. So uh, I'm not, I mean, it's a very, it's a very bitter one for me, I'm afraid, the funding issue. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. Um, our next question, this kind of touches on what we were talking about before, but the question reads, 
Given how much influence directors have over the interpretation and general feel of a production, what can we do to make the world of opera more diverse? And what do you think the role of a director is in driving that shift in mentality towards creating a more inclusive art form? Um, well, the director has enormous responsibility on the diversity front. Of course he does, but as does everybody. So the director, I mean, part of the job of the director is to make sure that every single person in his team and in his part, which is an awful lot of people, believes that is part of the statement you've just made. Uh, we have to drive everybody else in one direction. Um, you're not powerful unless you run a company. Otherwise, the director is not powerful in opera. It's a fallacy. Um, you're influential. You have choices. But you're, you're a worker. You work for somebody else. Um, and you have a lot of people sharing and interfering with your decisions. Um, and you need to figure out how to negotiate that. Every relationship with a management or a conductor is different. Um, whatever stage of your career you're at, actually. I mean, I'm now at this end of my career, but it's different where I work, how much influence I have over some things. Even now at La Scala, nobody wants to know what I think about the singers. Even now, they, they do the singers and that's who they are. Um, then we argue if I don't like somebody, but that's a fact. Most opera houses, I'm heavily involved in the casting. That's very good. I insist, of course, on a level of diversity in casting wherever it's possible. In England, now it is possible. In Birmingham, I do it myself, it's dead easy, obviously. Um, I have a project coming up at English National Opera. That's fine. That they were very open to and enthusiastic about, I think. Um, but still it's, I mean, you do have a responsibility, but you do in the way you live your life, I think. Um, you do, and some of it is just, it is about, I mean, I'm a great believer, I'm afraid in positive discrimination because it's the only way I've, found myself able to be effective. Also with myself, targets uh, are very important, I think. Um, and there are many, many ways of defining the word excellence. The best possible, all of those things. You could tell, I think, that from the way I'm, I'm talking about the chorus of La Scala and the chorus in Birmingham. I think they're both excellent, but of course, the excellence of La Scala cannot be achieved in Birmingham. My rather contentious idea is that that raw emotional urgency of Birmingham is unattainable because it's been schooled out of the chorus at La Scala. You will always find who you need to play a role if you look hard enough. Um, don't be in here. The point about what gives a director real leverage operatically though, and we haven't spoken about this, but it actually defines who I am, so we should, is uh, musicianship. Um, that is it. It's again, it's about speaking the language, isn't it? You know, it's not just speaking Italian because you're an Italian language, it's speaking the language of music, technically, comfortably, so that you have an area of freedom of exchange. So there isn't an area that's theirs and an area that's yours. I have very open relationships with, with great conductors who trust me a lot because historically it's what I do. 
and are, and are known to do. Um, and it's why I do the casting, because I cast not, as people think directors do, by what they look like and how they act, but how their voice acts. Do I hear the emotional range I need for, well, let's say butterfly, again, for a moment? Or do I see this fascinating little beautiful actress who'll be marvelous? Or do I think what I need is this big sound that will play theatrically some of those qualities? These, are, these kind of decisions matter quite a lot because they give you, comfort. They, they, they open doors to you. People will always try and shut the director out, but you can get in, you can get through there if you if you're on the ball if you're on the language. I had a breakthrough moment once with Ricardo Muti, who is a very haughty, arrogant, distant, condescending man. Um, and we were doing our tell, and he was being he was being really distant. Hardly spoken to me, even though. We'd worked before, he'd asked me. We were at a music rehearsal uh, and Domingo was yet to arrive. It was the first music rehearsal and the second cast was, uh, tenor was Russian. So Muti's kind of there, uh, starts speaking to the tenor. The tenor just looks at him and says, don't you speak Italian? And I translated into Russian. This is icy moment. <laughs> Well, I thought he was going to explode. And he looks at me and says, you speak Russian? I say, well, I'll do it. The next day, obviously, there was an interpreter. But from that moment on, double respect from this man. He didn't care what I was doing on the stage. No respect for that, because I was a director. I was just doing that theatre bit. Didn't really matter, as long as it didn't get in the way. But I could speak Russian? Chapeau. That is the true world of opera. I think we're going to have to close there. But so, Graham, thank you so much. This has been such an interesting talk and you've really been insightful. And I'm sure everyone on the other side will have found this truly a, a great talk. Um, I'm now going to hand over back to Priya. But that's me for today. Thank you very much for tuning in. And thank you, Graham. Thank you very much, Selena. Thank you. Thank you. And I only wish I could see who on earth I've been talking to. <laughs> what a very strange experience. Yeah, I'm sure it's a strange experience for all of us. But still, it's wonderful that we're all here. And we can hear um, such fresh, I think, um, innovative perspectives from people who we've looked up to and will continue to look up to, I'm sure, as we uh, build our careers. So on that note, thank you so much, Sir Graham, for spending the last hour with us. And thank you, Zelina, for taking us through it. And finally, a huge thank you to our audience. We hope you've enjoyed and um, we're very excited that next week at the same time, that's Tuesday, the 2nd of February at 6 p.m., we're going to have um, Dr. Kamala Shankaram with us talking about her work and her experiences so be sure to tune in to that as always these talks are freely available so if you missed it or missed the first half you can always come back around and watch it but thank you so much and good night or good day wherever in the world you may be good night everybody